Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to our amazing McCraw community. Yeah. This is episode four. And um, if you're just tuning in for the first time, go back, watch episode one. We kind of talk about the vision behind the podcast. Two is the Passover. And then three is unleavened bread. And then today is first fruits. So brother AJ, we were talking about first fruits. And just to recap a little bit, we we have made it out of Egypt. (laughs) We have gone through the Passover. We have eaten crackers for a week um and lamb we've done it all we've we've done it all we've made sure that there's no leaven in our homes um and if you missed last week's episode it is it was my favorite thus far but aj as he kind of did a sneak peek at the end said this is probably going to be one of his favorites so i am ready i'm buckled up and i am ready to learn today and let's see what god has in store for us today aj how are you doing Man, I'm doing great, man. Good. I want to just say, I love you, Levi. <laughs> you're awesome, bro. I want to say I love you too. I'm so glad you're doing this, man. It, me, me too. I've gotten, uh, I've gotten a lot of text messages and different things from people, and they're like, man, I just love what Levi brings. So, just wanted to say that, man. You're, yeah, I've just bring, you are loved. Uh, uh, well, thank you, thank you. That means a lot. Well, you are loved too. You're the you're dropping bombs, and I'm just getting my mind blown um, with the rest of our community. I would assume, but let's get into this today. It's gonna be awesome. Yeah. So we've, as you said already, we've come out of Egypt and we've killed a lamb. We've eaten crackers, and it's just gonna keep going from there, man. It doesn't stop. There's more feasts to come. There's more mikras to have. And so we're going to jump into uh, first fruits. Now, uh, if you're just listening in, definitely recommend you go back and listen to the others. But if you just kind of want to lock and load here, just want to remind you that we're on the festival of Passover still. It's like a nesting doll. There's Passover, unleavened bread, and this is it. This is the last one in Passover, and it's first fruits. After this, we're going to move on to Shavuot, or as it's famously known, Pentecost. So this is going to close out the Passover feast that would take place at the beginning of their year. And so I'm going to read Leviticus 23, verse 9 and 10. Okay, let me take a look at that. So verse 9 and 10, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, Notice this, the timing is important. When you enter the land, which I am going to give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring in the sheaf, of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. Now, somebody who's in our age bracket is really going to appreciate this because we're finally going to know what sheaves for Christ meant. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Does anybody else not know what a sheaf was? No, I don't think anybody has moved the mission now. So if you're Gen Z and you're being brought up on move the mission, we were raised up on sheaves for Christ. Sheaves for Christ. This is a big deal. And if you're a guest listening in and you don't know what we're talking about, it's too much to explain. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But uh, the festival was to be performed once they entered the promised land, as you can see. And we're going to we're going to look into why uh, when we dig in a little bit more. But let's jump to verse 11 and read through 14 now. Okay. So you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruit, your harvest to the priest. Verse 11, he shall wave the sheaf. Now, the word sheaf there is the Hebrew word Omer, which is where we get the word Omer. Um, So let's just use the Hebrew word there for Omer. He shall wave the omer before the Lord for you to be accepted on the day after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. Now on the day when you wave the omer, you shall offer a male lamb one year old without defect for a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall be two tenths of an ephah, a fine flour mixed with oil, an offering by fire to the Lord for a soothing aroma with its drink offering a fourth of a hen of wine. Until this same day, until you have brought in the offering of your God, you shall eat neither bread nor roasted grain nor new growth. It is to be, notice this, a perpetual statute. 
Okay, so the word statute there is a huka in Hebrew throughout your generation. So you notice that this is a statute or a huka. It's not a mikra. Okay, I want to make that distinction now because somebody listening to this who is a Bible scholar be like, bro, you're claiming this to be a mikra. This is not. This is a huka. So what is a huka? The yeah, English word know. statute does a decent job, but it's it's a custom. It's an authoritative rule, uh, essentially, something that has been prescribed. God told them that when they enter into the promised land, they were to establish a perpetual custom. So the Hebrew word for perpetual is olam. It means for a future time. So this custom is pointing to something coming in the future. So... This clearly is showing that we're looking forward to something that's coming. So this waving of the, the sheaf, the first fruits of a harvest, this was not just something you did when you felt like it. This wasn't just something you did every once in a while. This was a perpetual custom. This is pointing forward to something. So God has really arrested us and said, don't stop doing this. This is going to be really huge someday. And I need you to do it so you never forget. This custom is pointing forward. It's. I wish we could really dive into uh, the purpose of customs. A true biblical custom is to fulfill a revelation. It's to solidify a revelation. But I don't want to get off on the weeds on that. <laughs> so we're going to see that the festival of first fruits was celebrated on the day after Sabbath, meaning it would take place on the first day of the Jewish week, which was a Sunday. So they were to bring the sheaves or the omer, the omer, which just means, so if, if you want to know what omer is in Hebrew, it just means a bundle of something. That's, that's all that means. So a sheaf is a bundle of something. That's the transliterated or, or the translated word for omer. And they were to take that bundle of something, in this case, barley wheat, and they would wave it before the Lord. They would dedicate it to God. And the reason that this was to be done it was to be done when they entered the promised land. Now, you're going to notice that they didn't do this in the wilderness. God told them, said, when you go into the promised land, wow. then you do this, this custom and make it a perpetual custom. Why? Here's yeah. what we want to explore because this is really, really important and it's, it's going to have profound implications. And so really quick, Moses is telling the people of Israel they have to do this custom, right? That's right. And this is... This is a lot of stuff that they have to do. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is not welcome just Welcome to like, Israel. <laughs> yeah, welcome to Israel. This is not like, uh, hey, just bring uh, some barley and you'll be good, my guy. No, it's this yeah. is a lot of stuff that they're having to really do. And uh, I, maybe, I don't know if sacrifice is the right word, but they have to really, uh, in order to get there and bring this custom, this was a big deal. Yeah. I mean, this is a lot of stuff that they're bringing in. Um, but go ahead. Yeah, I was just I was just kind of blown away by all the stuff that's being asked of them at this point. Yeah. So it's really bringing into light the biblical custom or uh, not custom, but the biblical revelation of work. Yeah. You know, this is, this is not for the faint of heart. This is going to require work. And to what end? Well, when you finish the movie, <laughs> yeah, you're going to see, Oh man, I'm so glad we did that. Cause we would have never seen, we would not have understood the grand finale. Right. And so this episode here, this perpetual custom of first fruits is to be done when they enter the promised land. And that's really important because when you get to the promised land, that's when you're going to start producing by your labor as they will till up fields. They're going to plant seed. It's going to be irrigated. They're going to reap a harvest. They're going to cut the stalks. Everything is now done by their hands. It's up until that point of entering the promised land, God has fully sustained them by providing bread from heaven in the form of manna. So a transition is going to take place in the promised land to where God's going to, and, and you'll see this in Deuteronomy that when they enter the promised land, the manna ceased. So God is not sustaining them anymore. They're moving into the promised land and they're going to start getting a harvest. They're going to get their own food by the work of their own hands. So why is that a custom? Because the very nature of toiling in physical labor, it can cause us to forget our spiritual nature. 
Mm. This was a custom because God knew when you get over there, when you're no longer sustained by mana, you go into that promised land and you are working the fields, you're tilling it, you're planting, you're, you're uh, harvesting all of that. You're going to get so inundated with labor and toil that you're going to forget. <laughs> you're going to forget all about me. So offer me the first fruits so you don't forget how you got to this to begin with. It's a memorial unto God. So this custom would be what would remind them of their spiritual na nature. God gave the farmer these instructions so that they would remain conscious of their true purpose in life, which was to love, serve, and obey God. They were to depend on him for everything. So by offering the first fruit of the harvest to the Lord, that farmer was acknowledging his total dependence on God and that God was the one who provided the harvest, not just the toil of the farmer. The farmer participated, but he doesn't get all the credit. So this is really going to make sense when we get towards the end of this. So let's, let's build out the historical context a little bit more so that we can get in the, the mindset of an, an ancient Semitic person. Yeah. So a small plot of ground was set apart in the Kidron Valley to grow this first fruits offering. And before any of the barley could be eaten or even touched, you couldn't even touch it until an omer, a small bundle, would be brought to the temple as an offering to the Lord. The period between this feast and the feast of Shavuot or Pentecost is called the time of the counting of the omers, where they would begin counting on day one of the feast, being, you know, the feast of first fruits. And on day one, they would count for the next 50 days. Today is the first day of the omer. Today is the second day of the omer. Today is the third day, etc. This is leading up to the harvest. So according to a Jewish scholar, uh, Alfred Elderheim, he, uh, he's a Jewish scholar who converted to Christianity. He says that the sheaves were cut late in the afternoon, just before sunset. And when the time for the cutting of the sheaf had arrived, a large, loud crowd of worshipers followed representative leaders to the place where the first fruits were to be harvested. So imagine you're in, you know, the promised land and there's a whole group of people walking together and they're worshiping and they're following those that were going to cut the sheaves. And they get to the little consecrated plot of land in the Kidron Valley and that, that priest cuts the first stalks and everyone's worshiping and everyone's praising God. And they would march back, still worshiping, bringing this bundle of something, barley, to the temple. It was almost dark as they sang. They played their instruments. They would dance. They would celebrate the goodness of God. And after that, that omer was cut, the people praised the Lord and retraced their paths back up the slopes of the temple mount to an altar. It was now officially the morrow after the Sabbath. It was the next day. This is the first fruits festival. It's the beginning. Elderheim says that the ears were brought into the court of the temple and they were thrashed with canes or stalks so as not to injure the grain. Then parched on a pan, perforated with a bunch of holes so that each grain might be touched by the fire. The omer was mixed with three-fourths of a pint of oil and a handful of frankincense were put on it. Then they were waved before the Lord. So the first fruit stalks from that ceremonial field would be hovered over the fire and all the stalks would be touched by it. Then they would consecrate this harvest to God. They were saying, God, before we even touch any of the produce, before we go and eat, before we do any of that, we're giving this first batch to you because we know you're the reason why we had a harvest. It's to you that receives all glory, all honor. Yes, we may have tilled the field. We may have planted the seed, but God, you're the God of the harvest. We're not. We, we had no control over the weather. We just did what you asked of us. And so they would consecrate, they would dedicate this first fruit unto God. Wow. This very act of first fruits reminded the Hebrew people, we're just stewards of the land. Yeah. That's all we are. 
So offering the first fruit actually consecrated the entire harvest to God. If God accepted the first fruit of the harvest, it meant that the entire harvest would also be accepted by God. So this is the historical background. Now, why is this, why is this a hukkah? Why is this a perpetual custom? Yeah. Well, when Jesus shows up, man, oh, Jesus, <laughs> it's good people, man, the yeah. Bible, bro. So Jesus fulfills this feast, bro. This is why this is one of my favorites, because this is the message, bro. This is what we, I mean, it's all good, but this part is the exciting part. Yeah. It was when Jesus resurrected, when Jesus came out of that tomb, mm. it was the festival of first fruits. It was the day after the Sabbath. He was the resurrected first fruits from the dead. Wow. His very resurrection marked the beginning of the harvest of souls who would also be set apart. So this is, this is so powerful. The, the doctrine of justification yeah. is something that is so profound. Jesus, as we looked at in the last episode, he has no leaven in him. He's without spot. He's without blemish. He's got no world system in him. He's been pierced. He's been beaten. He is not appealing, but, oh, man, there, he's not puffed up. Right. So by him being buried now, as he resurrects, he is now the first fruits of perfection. If he'll be accepted, then the entire harvest can also be accepted. Jesus justified us. I, and what does justification mean? Let me, let me explain this just really quickly for anybody who may, may be new or maybe not understand the power of justification. Jesus became our attorney. That's what he did. And here's the truth. We did the crime. You know, we, yeah. there's no denying that. And Jesus goes to court. In fact, the word advocates, you know, John writes in first John, um, my little children, I write unto you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the father. Jesus Christ, the righteous, that word advocate in Greek is a, it's an attorney. He's a uh, defender. And so Jesus, when he resurrected, he had no, there was nothing wrong with him. There was no sin in him. And he was waved. He was the wave offering into heavenly places. And by him being without spot and blemish and perfect through his resurrection, he's beginning the process of removing the leaven from us so we committed the crime yeah that's that but through his burial on unleavened bread he enters a place where we should have gone the land yeah. of the dead and he goes down there and he, you know we we were to be given a uh, penalty by our sins of eternity in hell without parole and jesus does what no lawyer would ever think of doing. He's like, okay, look, all I need you to do is just confess to me that you did the crime. And you're like, but God, if I do that, I'm gonna get locked away for eternity. He's like, no, no, no. If you confess, I can get eternity reduced to like three days. <laughs> so, but here's the thing is if you confess, you did it. Here's what I'll do as your lawyer. I won't just defend you. I'll take the penalty you deserve. That's what I'll do. You did oh, the crime. My. I'll do the time. <laughs> so when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We were supposed to say that. Wow. And he said it on our behalf and he nailed, as Paul said, our debts to the cross. And so when he was buried, he's, he's got the power now to remove the leaven from our lives, but he can't just die. He has to resurrect. So through his resurrection on first fruits, he is the acceptable consecrated harvest. He's the first grain of yeah. a harvest that will come later. But that first bundle of barley had to be accepted. And mm. if it's accepted, if the first fruits are accepted by God, then God can bless the entire harvest. So Jesus was accepted because there was no, no leaven in him. 
He is the first fruits. And so now that he has been consecrated and blessed, anyone who is also buried can have the leaven removed, but they can't just be buried. They have to resurrect. So let's Paul, let's look at that. Paul's going to really develop this theology from his Jewish background. While Jesus was in the world, he was the manna from heaven, according to John six. But when he was inspected as the lamb during Passover and then beaten and pierced during unleavened bread, he was buried as the seed of woman to fulfill the feast of first fruits. You see how he's strategically fulfilling everything? Yeah. Now, I want you to consider this strange message from Jesus in John 12, uh, 23 and 24. Jesus is going to point to this uh, first fruits in himself right here. So Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. He's speaking of his death here. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, (laughs) here's the end. It bears much fruit. A harvest is coming, but that can't happen. Until the seed, well, I'm the seed of woman. If you bury me, oh my, <laughs> you, you have no idea what you're about to do. Like, that's why, that's why the Bible says if they had known, they would have never crucified him. Yeah. He's like, burying me is the, that's, that is the plan. If you bury me, you've buried the seed. And if that, if that wheat falls into the earth and it dies, here's what it's going to do. It's going to raise up a harvest. <laughs> so, bro, watch. It just it just keeps getting better. <laughs> Jesus refers to himself as a grain of wheat and declares that unless it give itself over to the process of death and burial in soil, then it can never fully become what it was always intended to be. The seed is but the beginning. The seed, I, how in the world can a seed, I, think about that, like, we don't even have time to go into this, but man, a seed. Yeah. Who would have ever known that much potential is locked up inside of a little seed. Wow. That it can only manifest through death though. Like yeah. these concepts of biblical theology seem so crazy to us, but we, we drive down the highways and see it every day that that pine tree that towers, you know, 60 feet in the air. That was a seed at one point. Yeah. Like, who would have ever known that that much potential was locked inside something that all it needed to do was die. Wow. What Jesus was in the earth, man, wait till he dies. <laughs> you thought Jesus in his earthly ministry was, was something to behold. So Paul confirms that Jesus fulfilled this feast in his discussion to the saints in Corinth. So first Corinthians 15 verse 20, and we'll read through 23. Paul doesn't make allusions. He just comes right out and says it. He says, but the fact is Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep for since by a man, death came. He's talking about Adam there by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. So the first Adam brought death. The second Adam brought resurrection from death for as in Adam, all die. So also in Christ, all will be made alive. But mm. each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits after that, those who are Christ at his coming. So by Jesus becoming that first fruit, it's guaranteeing a harvest. Jesus was the human Omer that was set apart for the purpose of conquering death by resurrection. He would be the first fruits of a larger harvest later as those who also die will be resurrected like he was. So remember that Jesus was crucified on Wednesday, the 14th to fulfill Passover. He was buried at the close of Wednesday, the beginning of Thursday, the 15th to fulfill unleavened bread. He resurrected at the close of the weekly Sabbath and the beginning of the first day of the week on the 18th which is first fruits. <laughs> what? 
How is this so obvious and they missed it? Oh, bro. I I have no idea, man. They've been watching the movie a long time. I guess they they fell in love so much with the custom. Yeah. That they didn't see when the the grand finale was here. They were disappointed in the grand finale. They were caught up in tradition. Yeah. Versus seeking truth. It's it's also so interesting that like, you know, it's one thing for Jesus. We we know historically that it's been proven archaeologically that there was literally a man who walked this planet named Jesus. Right. And he caused an insurrection within Israel and really, you know, tossed a monkey wrench into the you know, the judicial system. But we can we can kind of reason away Jesus being God because yeah. you know we can we can reason and say, well, yeah, anybody who ticks off the Pharisees is going to get killed. Anybody who yeah. goes before Rome. And yes, but how in the world can he he wasn't just killed. He was killed on Passover, buried yeah. during unleavened bread, right. and then resurrected. resurrected. They found an empty tomb on the first day of first fruits. First fruit. Like the, the thing is there's no way a random yeah. mere mortal could do this. Right. To the, and to just the so minute. happenstance. Yeah. To the minute. Yeah. And it doesn't stop. It just keeps going on. You, you have to make a decision that, okay, we know historically a man named Jesus showed up. And if he's a, just a mere man, the dude's got the best luck I've ever seen. And that's what puts him apart from, say, John the Baptist. Oh, or, sure. Or, you know. That's a good point. I don't know. A any kind of different prophets that if people want to say, well, you know, there was other people that, uh, like John the Baptist, you can point to that. But to resurrect, I mean, that by itself, but, but just the way it fell in line and, like, come on. <laughs> yeah. How? Uh, I mean, that's, it's, yeah. Irrefutable. It's ordained. Yeah. Well, Matthew 28, Matthew uh, shows us this, and I didn't give you these scriptures in advance, so I don't know if you want to okay. go hunting them down. You can keep talking. I'll try to pull it up. What is it, Matthew? Matthew 28, verse 1 through 6. Matthew's going to give us uh, the account. He's going to show us the timeline. It's not just like, oh, you know, AJ, you're twisting the timeline and you're wanting to make it fit. No, it's it's in the text. It's It's there. Matthew uh, gives us this account in uh, the first verse of Matthew 28. He says, now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said, come see the place where he was laying. Mm. It, this Matthew tells us it was after the Sabbath. That's <laughs> the day where they would be waving the sheaf offering. Yeah. waving the bundle of barley. So John adds a further detail in John 20, 17. He tells Mary, don't touch me. You, you remember this part where they're in the tomb and she sees a, a gardener, this, this farmer in the, in the tomb. And she's like, that's not Jesus. That's just some gardener over there. And yeah. He's, he's harvesting. Um, and he looks at her and he says, don't touch me. John 17, 20. And this is. Oh, John 17, 20. Okay, I'm sorry. This has baffled people and it's frustrated people. So the stop clinging to me is the literal translation. The Greek, it's touch me not. Why? Mm. Why can't she touch him? Well, if you remember the perpetual custom is. You don't touch the harvest until it's been presented as the wave offering. Oh my. He's the first fruits. He's just been cut from 
from the ground that he was buried in. He's been relieved from the soil because he's been cut from it. He's been cut from death. And so he's got to be waved as a first fruit in heavenly places as the, the consecrated land. And if he's accepted, then all who follow him will also, the rest of the harvest will be accepted by the father. And so don't touch me. I'm, you know, the custom, this is, I don't want to like 1000% say that that's what's happening here, but culturally it's checking out as to why Mary couldn't touch him. Right. So it was at the time that the first fruits were cut way before God, that Jesus would have emerged from the tomb. And at the same time, the barley uh, sheaf couldn't be touched until it was offered to God. So too, Jesus couldn't be touched. Jesus was the wave offering of a blessed harvest of many others who would also resurrect. Mm. Here's something interesting. And I'll just, again, I'm not going to build a, a big doctrine on this, but it's pretty interesting. It's important to note the fact that the barley sheaf, the Omer, the Omer is a bundle of something. It's not just one grain. It's many stalks bundled together and they would wave yeah. the bundle. So it consisted of a number of individual barley stalks that had been bundled together. And isn't it interesting that Matthew tells us in chapter 27 that other graves were opened and many bodies of those who had fallen asleep were also raised in coming out of the graves after his resurrection. After Jesus resurrected, this important that he was the first fruits, and then a bunch of other little stalks crop up, and together they were waved as a bundle. Wow. Could it be? Could it be? <laughs> it was, it's uncanny the timing. Yeah. And I want to be humble here and not like make it. That's what it is. Yeah. But it's intriguing. Right. So when the time came to harvest the crop, the farmer would go into his uh, field and inspect the first fruits crop. Right. He accepted the first fruits. Then the rest of the harvest would also be acceptable to him. Jesus was accepted as blameless mm. through his resurrection because there was no leaven in him. He was the acceptable first fruits. So too, those who have been grafted into the vine will also be found acceptable. Paul alludes to this truth as he speaks to the Christians in Rome when he says in Romans 8, 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Jesus became our representative. He became our lawyer. And by presenting himself as acceptable, he consecrated the rest of us. We have become an acceptable harvest through his death, his burial, his resurrection. Romans eleven sixteen says it this way. If the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also. And if the root is holy, then the branches are too. Wow. You see what Paul's doing in Romans? He talks about unleavened bread. If the piece of dough is holy, then the lump that follows is also. And then he talks about first fruits. And if the root is holy, the branches are too. So what does this mean for me and you? That's the, what's the personal application? Yeah. Right. Unleavened bread. It teaches us about our burial with Jesus. That's what unleavened bread does. Him being free from leaven is able now to remove leaven from us through burial. Paul tells us that when we're baptized, it's a type of burial. We are buried with him in baptism. So, but being buried is not enough. That's not the end. Burial. Let, let me say this culturally. Do you know what they did with criminals that were hanged on crosses in that, that century? No. No. They threw their bodies into a big uh, pit, Gehenna, and they would set the bodies on fire. Mm. That's what they did with criminal bodies. You know, nobody cared about those bodies. 
And it's so important to know that if Jesus did not care about burial, he would have just been thrown into the gorge with all the other criminals. Yeah. But if you do that, if there's no burial, there's no proof of resurrection. There has to be a burial to show that there was a proof of a resurrection. So this is important because if it wasn't a big deal to God, if he's just like, I'll just follow the custom of the day and I'll be tossed into Cana, then why did Joseph of Arimathea walk 26 miles to give over his burial plot? Mm. Because when you seal a man in the tomb and then you come back and that stone is moved, we have proof that someone was here and now they're not. Yeah. But if you burn the body, there's no proof of a resurrection. It's just, he's gone. But burying him now gives proof of resurrection. If baptism's not important, he would have never gone through the trouble of moving on Joseph of Arimathea. Right. <laughs> so unleavened bread teaches us this reality that through his burial, the leaven can be removed because there was no leaven in him. He now has authority to remove the leaven from us. Mm. Thus, as we mentioned in the last episode, we live separated from the world system. Now, it's it's really important to note that just um, removing the leaven is really, that's not even dig digging into the depths of what baptism does. He doesn't just remove the leaven. He replaces the whole lump. Yeah. You're not even the same after you've come out of that water. Wow. Burial, you have changed. The old is gone. Mm. It is no more. He didn't just come in and like, okay, we're going to keep the lump and just try to pick out all of the... No, it's done away with. You're right. a new creature. So that's that's the revelation of unleavened bread. First fruit, though, teaches us about our resurrection with Jesus. Not only is the old leaven removed, but an entire new loaf is in its place through resurrection. Wow. We have been saved from our old life into yeah. the resurrected life with Christ. Mm. Merely putting off the old man is not enough. We yeah. must also put on the new man. Yeah, there's there's no telling who listens, who who is listening to this and who will listen. But I, I can't imagine and I don't want I'm not gonna cherry pick certain life instances and this will extrapolate across the whole, but I couldn't imagine a young lady who maybe has been raped and just feels like I've lost I've lost my innocence, I've lost my purity. Yeah. The moment of baptism you're restored to what you were before, what you were before you lost mm -hmm. anything. It is not merely of, you know, you're just, he didn't just take a dry erase and wipe off the dry erase ink off the board. He took the whole board down and put a whole yeah, new but, freshly packaged board on there. It's not the same as it was before. There's not even the creation. inkling of the dry erase left on it because he's done away with the whole dry eraser board and put on a whole new one. Wow. That's, we are made new. Yeah. Whatever you have done in your life, it doesn't matter. At the moment of baptism, wiped away. It is the power that he possesses. Mm. Baptism is not just some little old custom. It's not just some petty thing that Christians do. It is, I believe it is the most powerful thing in this world. Like, Bro, I was sitting in a class one time, and it was the most random class to be in. It's a demonology class, and that was, you know, I was exploring that in my understudy. <laughs> and uh, Professor was reading from the Book of Enoch and all this stuff, and, you know, it's historical document trying to understand Second Temple Judaism. And, bro, so the Book of Enoch, if you've never read it, it's just, I'll give you the 30,000 foot view real quick. And this is all relevant. I promise. I know it feels like I'm way off yeah. track here, No, no, no. but the Book of Enoch overarching view, just really quick, 30,000 foot view is, you know, Enoch didn't write it by the way. It's, you know, somebody else wrote it. And Enoch is that guy who walked with God and was not for, he was taken that whole thing. Well, mm -hmm. Enoch is a, he's a solid dude, you know, 
<laughs> and he's he goes down to the land of the dead and those those principalities that have been bound they're down there and they're like hey can you go tell yahweh we're sorry you know we we kind of want to leave this joint and he's like yeah i'll go i'll go talk to him and goes up to yahweh and he's like you know what do you want us to tell him and uh he's like tell them that they're bound in chains of gloomy darkness which jude will quote and peter will quote um this direct copy and paste from the book of Enoch. and he goes back down there and he's like hey guys you're bound here you're you're bound in the land of the dead. Well, Jesus, when he was buried, God himself went down there and sent word. He's like, I'm not sending Enoch. I'm telling you yourself. You guys are bound wow. here in chains of gloomy darkness, but I'm not. Yeah. There's no, the curse was you would be returned to soil. I have no dirt in me. I'm not made from man. I'm made from woman. <laughs> Woman is made from the finished work of the first of this first Adam. She's made from bone. Man was made from dust. My heavenly father's side has no dirt in him and my mother has no dirt in her. So I can't go to dust. So he takes the keys and he goes back. This was, this is what's happening in the burial. When you and I are buried, it's for a moment under that water. It's a symbol of baptism. You are telling all of every principality in hell. Mm. You're being buried. And they're like, we got one. There's one that's coming down to the land of the dead. And then they hear, they hear the name Jesus, which means Yahweh saves in Hebrew. And when we come out of that water, they stop and they say, that's another one we'll never get. Wow. They've been, they've resurrected. It's a new creation. It's a new creation. Yeah. That's that symbol. We're being in baptism. We're being put down into the land of the dead like Jesus. And because he resurrected, he is the first fruits of many more that will also resurrect baptism, bro. Golly, just come on. Yeah. Why does that matter? Why is this my favorite lesson, bro? Because without this other part that means we just die. Yeah. We cease to exist. There's no way out. There's no way out. That's I lived a good life. Uh, you know, I was able to have peace because of the power of Passover and I was able to live a holy life because of unleavened bread, but that's that the journey's over. No death mm. is the beginning. Death is where the journey starts for me and you. That's why Paul said to be absent from this body to be present from the Lord and oh I want to be with the Lord but it's more beneficial to you he's telling Philip Philippians that I stay here but oh I'm ready to die because I want to go I'm ready to go to that that place bro yeah. I am eat up with this because because of the power of this amazing message man I don't lose my son Levi right I get him back <laughs> yeah why why in the world would I be afraid of pandemics? You know, I heard a preacher one time, man, he went down to <laughs> he went down in front of the bar and he was preaching the gospel and a guy came out and he said, Preacher, you've ruined my buzz. So the next day he went and preached again and the same drunk guy came out and he says, Preacher, you've ruined my buzz two nights in a row. And so he went back the third night and the guy came out and he says, Now preacher, you've ruined my buzz three nights in a row. If you're here on that fourth night, I'm gonna shoot you. Somebody asked the preacher, they said, What did you do? And he looked at him, he said, I went and preached. On the fourth day, yeah. he went, and they said, why would you go? He's threatening to kill you. He said, how are you going to tempt me with seeing the Lord? <laughs> exactly. You understand. Don't like, me. We don't test death. That's not what – I'm not out here driving 160 miles an hour trying to get there sooner. But right. Right. if I'm caught up in the rapture or I am, I am killed, it's – bro, it ends the same. Right. That's the beginning. I resurrect. Yeah. Because yeah. the same spirit that raised Christ is going to quicken this mortal body and I will be raised. We have been saved from our old life into the resurrected life with Christ. This is our confidence. This is our peace. This is our joy. And just putting off the old man through baptism, that's beautiful. But the next step is putting on the resurrection. Mm. So, Paul said in Ephesians 4, 24, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness 
and holiness of the truth. This new nature of God is coming through the Spirit. This new man is resurrecting with power through the Spirit, Christ in us. Paul had this in mind when he said to those in Corinth, he says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old mm. things have passed away, and behold, new things have come. Paul lays out the process to those in Galatia when he writes in Galatians 2, 20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Christ alive in us means we are now dead to our sins. And when we walk mm -hmm. in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit means that he's in me and I'm continuing in his character. That means now walking in the Spirit. Everybody has the question, what does it look like to walk in the Spirit? It means that the character of Christ is now the dominant force in you. So now, instead of anger, love. Love. Yeah. Instead of depression, joy. joy. Yeah. That's the dominant force in us now. Wow. So James wrote that we have to put our trust in Jesus. And by receiving his spirit, we are a kind of first fruits of God's mm. creatures. He says this in James 1, 18. James is meaning here. He says, we now are the first fruits of the kingdom. Look at us. Do you see all of us who were buried like he was buried? We've resurrected like he was resurrected. Do you see the character that's manifest in us? Do you see what we are? On this earth, we're the first fruits of what the heavens are going to look like when you're raptured on over there. The joy you see in me, that's forever over there. The peace you mm. feel, that's forever over there. This, bro, this is the greatest message in yeah. the world. It's, it just is. Yeah. I want to pull up a scripture. Um, and while you're pulling that up, I just want to talk about this really quick. Um, this kind of points to how important it is to be baptized in the water. Yes. In Jesus name. I don't want to take it for granted that people watching this might not know exactly about that. And then maybe they were baptized a different way, but I mean, it's important to be buried under the water and not just sprinkled. Um, but I believe it's essential to be buried in the water, to be baptized in Jesus name. Um, yeah. So you bring up a great point and I, I tell this story often. Um, a lot of questions, why the name, why are we so big on the name? And I never want to be arrogant and be like, you know what? We're right about everything. We're not. I mean, we're, I believe this message yeah. is absolutely right. And I believe we're learning other revelations and the name though. Let, let, let's talk about that name. I was sitting in yet another class and in that class, it was another demonology class, ironically. Man, you like some demonology. Classes. No, man, this is just this was the this was the season. <laughs> oh, it's like what class do I sign up with? Yeah, give me the demon. Give me the demon class. So what was so so crazy is in that class, yeah. um Dr. Andre Mira, my professor, he was like uh he was I think he was from uh Colombia or something, Hispanic guy. Amazing. I loved him. But anyway, he was talking about how in the Bible our adversary doesn't have a name. So yeah. demon isn't a name. Devil's not a name. Lucifer is not a name. That is a Latin transliteration that was never fully translated. It's from the Latin Vulgate. It means son of the morning. It's not a name. Um, Satan is not a name. It's always so Satan everywhere in the Bible has the article the in front of it. It's the Satan. Mm. It's the opposer, the slanderer, the gossiper. Those are some definitions of that name. And so I asked Dr. Andre, I was like, well, why doesn't he have a name? And he's like, Aaron, he's not worthy of a name. And I said, well, what does that mean in your culture? He said, well, we want to strip you of dignity. We take the name from you and we will not give you the dignity of even having a name. And I said, well, he's a father of lies, right? He said, yes. 
I said, he's a son of perdition, according to the Bible. He said, yes. I said, he's an evil spirit, according to the Bible. He said, yes. He said, but our own, those are titles. I said, exactly. Yeah. I said, so if I baptized in a title, what have I done in your culture? And he smiled at me. He said, ah, <laughs> yeah. He said, you will have put our savior into the same category as a devil. Oh my. And that's what really nailed down the name. So let's, man, this isn't, we're, we're going to get into this in future podcasts, but let's look at yeah, yeah. why this is important. Abram came out of the line of one of Noah's sons, Shem. Do you know what the name Shem is in Hebrew? No. Name. His name was name. <laughs> Come here, name. You know, that was, that was his name. Yeah. What's your name, name? And remember that through uh, Ham and Japheth, the nations were, were estranged. And God comes and gets Abram and he says, and through you, I will make your name great. And through you, all nations will be blessed. Abram right. was out of the line of Shem. Jesus is out of the line of Shem. Their entire world was to point a to a name. <laughs> oh no. He pulled a man named Avraham, father of a multitude, out of the line of name, and through him I will make your name great, and all oh. nations will be blessed through you. Well, lo and behold, to him was given a name that was above every name, that at the name of Jesus. So what does Jesus mean in Hebrew? It means Yahweh saves. Saves. So I can prove Jesus' name baptism in the Old Testament. Literally, when uh, Moses was standing at the Red Sea, right, and the people saw Pharaoh and the Egyptians coming up behind him, and they said, did you lead us out into the wilderness to die? Were there not enough graves in Egypt? And Moses wow. says, do not fear, see the salvation of the Lord. Mm. The word Lord there is the transliteration or the translation that they refer to, but in the original Hebrew, it's Yahweh. Salvation is Shuach. He says, see Yah Shuach. Wow. And when he said see. that, waters parted. They went through the water. Pharaoh and the Egyptian armies came. Waters closed. They were not far from going around the Red Sea. Now, logically, they could have just said, let's go around the water. Like, they're closing in on us. Do, why are we sitting here waiting? Can't we just go around? Of course you can. You can go around. But if you do, Pharaoh is going to follow you the rest of your life. But if you go through the water, Pharaoh will never follow you again. It, it was, was baptism. baptism. And the last thing that was said was Yahshuach, <laughs> which got translated to Isus in Greek. So I get this question a lot, and somebody will have this question listening. Do we need to baptize in the name of Yeshua? Well, if they were, then Paul, writing to the Greeks, uses the Greek word Isus, which is the Greek translation of Yeshua. English, Jesus, is the English version of the Greek word Isus. So it's Yeshua, Isus, Jesus. John uses uh, Isus, the Greek name. Peter uses the Greek name. It's it all means the same. It's across multiple tongues. Jesus is sufficient to be baptized in. Yes. You know, I know people want to be very like precise, but Paul used the Greek name Isus. So if Paul was going to be rigid, he would have used the Hebrew name there and not have translated it over to Greek. But that baptism I... led to a new life where God is going to sustain them. God's going to bring them into a promised land. So the water was beautiful. That was the eradication of the old life. Yeah. But the resurrected yeah. life. <laughs> wow. Did did uh, Moses and God's people have unleavened bread when they went through the Red Sea? Yes. Or did, did we not eat? Did yeah, the eat? unleavened bread was, um, they would have had that in their houses before they were delivered. Before yeah. they were delivered. So as they go through the Red Sea, they had That's no right. leaven in them. And the old was passed away, and the new was come. Yo! Oh, yeah, my! All these, 
How 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 obvious right. is this? Dude, the Bible is the most beautiful thing in the world. Yep. I agree. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Like I love the Bible, but AJ, you are bringing a whole different meaning to this. It can defend itself. It defends itself. And everything is so obvious and it points yeah, to Jesus. This is all about Jesus. It has nothing to do with me. The only thing that I contribute is I'm an absolute rank sinner and I'm hopeless. Yeah. Enter Jesus. And he's like, I'll nail that debt to the cross. If you turn from your wicked ways, I'll go say the thing you deserve to say. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'll say it on your behalf. I'll take the penalty you deserve. I'll get it reduced. I'll wipe away all the leaven and I'll resurrect you. So they, yeah, they go through the Red Sea. I, I'm just, that, that just like that revelation there just blowing my mind. So in Pharaoh, I don't know. Okay, keep going. I, that's a so this has hit me so profoundly this year. Paul in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. In fact, why don't you pull that one up? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Okay, and let's go down to verse 12. This has really been, oh man, this is just kind of, um, I guess let me, let me pause for one second before I read this. If anyone is listening, I really, really, I believe in grace. I believe in compassion. I we are in no way negating anything you've ever experienced. I don't ever want to have this like elitist mindset. I want to be very, very humble. I I've spoken to people of different faith groups and they've blown me away. I've sat and looked at them in the face and wept over their humility, far more humble than I've learned so many lessons from people of other faith groups. And specifically, I remember talking with somebody from another faith group and they saw the importance of baptism in Jesus name. And they got rebaptized and yeah. I was so blown away by their humility. And I had to ask myself, would I have done that like them? Yeah. And what I told him is I said, here's the facts of when Moses was at the burning bush, that bush was real. The fire was real. There's no denying that. And so I told him, I said, the baptism you participated in was very real. I will never take yeah. that from you. You were sincere. You were obedient. It was beautiful. But don't stay at the bush when we know in Exodus 19, the mountain's going to burn. So yeah. that tree in Hebrew is a sene tree. That's what it is in Hebrew. The tree that God uh, or the bush that God was burning on was a sene tree. Don't you think an interesting in Exodus 19, a Sinai mountain is burning. It's the same word. And I said, don't stay at the bush if we know mountains can burn and don't stay on the mountain when we know our face can shine with the glory. We're moving from glory yeah. to glory to glory. And we're all somewhere on a journey still moving forward. I want to bear fruit. That's what I want. Yeah. So I, I don't want to be on this and somebody hear this and get deeply offended at me. And like, you're saying that it's all, I did all of that for nothing. I honor you for the decision just like yeah. those that were baptized according to John's baptism in Acts, they were sincere. They were, they felt everything and they responded to John. But then in Acts, they said, yeah, that was awesome. But there's another name now. It's, yeah. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. So Corinthians 15, 12 says, now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, and Paul's playing devil's advocate here, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain. Your faith is also in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise. If in fact the dead are not raised, for if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You still live in sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ, they have perished. They're gone. That's it. You'll never see them again. If we hoped in Christ only in this life, we are of all people most pitied. Let's, let's read on some more if you can. Yeah, let me, let me get the whole verse. Okay. 
But the fact is, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first yeah. fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man death came, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. So this is my thing, is if Christ didn't raise, our faith is worthless. We assemble on Sundays for no reason. If Christ hasn't resurrected, then this podcast is a hobby. It's not a passion. If Christ yeah. hasn't resurrected, then 30,000 teenagers just assembled in uh, at Youth Congress for no reason whatsoever. It was just all emotional hype. Then churches all across yeah. America of all all faiths are doing it for no reason. There's nothing to this. But yeah. Christ has risen. Christ. So you know what that means for me and you? Paul says it. Someday a trumpet's going to sound. Here's a spoiler alert. The feast at the end of the year was the festival of trumpets. <laughs> Just a little sneak preview of the the next episode. Season season three is coming, y'all. And when that trumpet sounds, <laughs> the dead in Christ oh are going to rise. Rise again. And those that are alive and remain shall be caught up with them in the air. Bro. Mm. Oh, man. Let's say I'm wrong. Let's say all of this is pure happenstance. It's conjecture. Let's say the Bible is just a good ancient Semitic book. Let's say that it's a fun story. It happens to line up, but none of that's true. And let's say I live this my whole life. I give myself over to it. I'm passionate about it. And then I die and I find out I just cease to exist. There is no resurrection. All of this was in vain. Then here's what I will have wasted. I would have wasted a peace filled life here on earth. I would have had joy instead of weeping, <laughs> yeah. you know, and 92% right. of marriages end in divorce when they lose a child. My wife and I would be divorced right now. If I didn't yeah. have this resurrection revelation, I never see Levi again. That's it. He's gone. It's over. It's, it's done away with the memories are fading. And so that's that he's, he's erasing from our memories and the erosion of time is taking from me, my son yet again. And I'd be miserable. Right. I'd be miserable. But if I'm right, <laughs> then I get peace here. I get wow. joy here. I become a loving yes. husband and father here. I yeah. have everything that I need. And when I resurrect, I get Levi back. I get joy unspeakable. I get my savior. Oh. It's not a gamble for me. I will do this no. every time because I win here. And according to the Bible, I win there as well. Oh, I'm not wow. living my best life. I'm living my rest life. I am resting in this salvation. So you're not moving me. Yeah. Steadfast, unmovable. And it's not because I'm strong. It's because no, the resurrection is. Weak. Yeah. Christ in us. That's the comfort. The days yeah. where you get emotional and you start, you start feeling it, which is inevitable. God whispers in my ear, resurrection's coming though. Wow. A random, random passage. It's in, um, same. Oh, wow. Same chapter. You still have that open first Corinthians 15. Yep. Let's read this and then we'll, whatever you feel to say, and then we'll start closing this down. Listen to the way this is all in the same passage of what Paul said. If, if Christ hasn't risen, then our faith is futile. Then he goes on. He says, yeah. but someone will say, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? And in typical Paul fashion, you fool. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. <laughs> yeah. Here it comes. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished. And to each of the seeds, a body of its own. <laughs> Paul refers to the resurrection. He uses the illustration of a seed going to the ground and dying. 
He says, mm. you're, you're obsessed with the seed. This life is the seed. Wait till this seed dies. Do you have any idea what we're going to be over there? I have no idea what, what body we will take on when we get over there. But why are you afraid to leave this life? Because leaving this life is to just plant the seed. And who knows what we will be over there? Wow. The seed is but the beginning of the potential that it is supposed to be. I don't know what I will be. But according to verse 42, look down there. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. Mm -hmm. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's not just some little weak seed. It's a mighty oak now. It is sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, then you can guarantee there's also a spiritual body. <laughs> Verse 49. Wow. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we're going to bear the image of the heavenly. Mm -hmm. Why? Because Jesus did. I'm going to be caught up with him. He was the first fruits of many more. So when Jesus resurrected, sneak peek, here we go. When Jesus resurrected, he was the first fruits of many brethren. It's not enough for just one. He wants a harvest. Pentecost is coming. <laughs> There's going to be a harvest. That's wow. And we're going to talk about that in the next and that's our next episode yeah. of Pentecost, huh? That's amazing. Wow. Thank you, AJ, for that amazing lesson. Man, just like you said, each one of these just keep getting better and better. And on this today's episode, we talked about baptism. And if there's anybody that's listening that wants to know more about baptism, please direct message us, send us a comment, something, and I will reach out to you. And I would love to talk to you about yeah. baptism in Jesus' name and being water baptized. And and we want to uh, hear your story, anything, too. Just, I don't want to just, man, yeah. I want, I've been so impacted by professors and other people. I, my faith has been solidified, but I've also been enlightened to, man, I'm, I don't bear as much fruit. I'm not as kind as some of these, these other people. And I've right. learned so much. Yeah. And this is not a we're better than anyone we don't believe that we're not a cult we don't believe that we're the only right ones i believe that we're growing together and we're, yeah. we're well, next we to have, other fields we have to grow together right and, and that's what i was going to say is at least just reach out to us so i can we can talk and 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 just i just we just want to we want to give back to the community yeah. that's listening to us and and not just give back but connect this is you know everyone listens to us on a podcast or watch us on youtube but we'd also like to listen to you as well so this whole mccrawl project project is connecting with each other and us yeah. all growing together that's right and so uh man what a great lesson today um anything else that you want to say before i wrap this go up? read your bibles <laughs> yeah, of course, go read your Bibles. Well, again, thank you so much for listening to this episode. Thank you for watching. And again, as I'll always say this. This does help us, um, especially the algorithm push push our name out there. If you would comment, like, subscribe, yeah. um, share this with anybody. And please comment. Again, we want to connect with you. So tell us how, how what you liked about this episode. If you have any questions, um, put that in the comments. And as we premiere this on YouTube, uh, I'm hanging out in the chat a lot of times, so please comment in the chat and uh, tell us what you like in each segment or each part of this lesson, and I'd, I would love to talk back to you. But uh, again, thank you so much for listening, and we look forward to our next episode, which is going to be yeah, Pentecost, right? Awesome. Well, we love y'all, and we look forward to seeing you in the next one.